Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Jordan Finken. I'm the Rare Book and Manuscript Librarian here. Uh, um, it's my very great uh, pleasure to welcome you today for the Matityahu Tzvat Memorial Lecture at the Clow Library of Hebrew Union College in vibrant Cincinnati. And as we tiptoe back to normality, today's lecture is brought to you before a live studio audience. So. <laughs> The Cloud Library is one of the world's truly great Judaica libraries, and so it is a special treat that today's lecture is one of the college's great book lovers. Jason Kalman, my friend and colleague as co-director of the Hebrew Union College Press, is professor of classical Hebrew literature and interpretation, as well as the chair in Jewish intellectual history here at the college. His numerous important scholarly books and articles testify to his formidable erudition and the depth of his engagement with the Jewish textual tradition. His most recent book, The Book of Job in Jewish Life and Thought, so, uh, soon to be hot off the presses from Hebrew Union College Press, so everyone go out and buy a copy, situates Jason in the forefront of contemporary scholarship of this enigmatic and deeply human book. We know Job best from the iconic images of his suffering. And I'm reminded of a joke in which a writer brings a rabbi uh, a book for his approbation. It's a commentary on Ecclesiastes. The rabbi flips through the book and sees that it's total rubbish. <laughs> so he says, Ecclesiastes, eh? You should have written on Job. Why is that? The writer asks, to which the rabbi responds, Job had so many miseries, what's one more? But what do you have against poor King Solomon? <laughs> but far from adding to Job's suffering, However, Jason's work grounds our understanding of how to grasp it and how Jewish tradition came to terms with its profound and complicated insights on the human condition. And I am delighted to introduce Jason Kalman and his talk, well known but rarely read, The Book of Job in Jewish Life and Thought. Thank you. Let me just share screens of these slides. Are up. You can see the slides? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yep. Let's hope the people at home can as well. Um, uh, let me start with uh, telling you how honored I am to uh, speak uh, today. Uh, the, to honor and remember uh, Professor Tzfat takes me to my own memories. I have a distinct uh, memory of standing in the stacks at the Jewish Public Library in Montreal just about 25 years ago, uh, pulling uh, Professor Tzfat's collected essays uh, from the shelf to read uh, his uh, The Meaning of Job. Uh, more intimately, perhaps, are the day-to-day -day efforts to forage in the library here and recognize that I spend my time learning from the same books he handled, uh, that uh, perhaps there is an intimacy uh, of contact uh, that, although I did not know him personally, uh, still keeps me uh, personally connected. Uh, my new book uh, could not have been written anywhere but here. Although the research began before my arrival at HUC in 2005, the dozens of HUC, UC, and Xavier colleagues who supported and challenged me, the many graduate and rabbinical students who together asked profound questions, and the near daily foraging in the Clow Library and American Jewish Archives with their extraordinary staff made the book possible. The book was a direct result of these conversations and from studying texts that can literally only be found here. I hope that my work stands as a tribute to the members of this incomparable learning community 140 years in the making. Although it has been part of sacred literature or Jewish sacred literature for more than 2000 years, the book of Job, which raises some serious questions about divine justice, has no regular place in the Jewish ritual and practice. It is not read publicly in the synagogue like the Torah and Megillot, nor as Haftarot like so many passages from the prophets. Citations are extremely rare in the Siddur and liturgy. But despite this absence, it has come to permeate Jewish culture. In this, it is well known, but rarely read. Today, I wish to highlight two matters that come out of my new book, the book of Job in Jewish life and thought along with some new material, or as I've said to my students, you don't know what you know until you learned it. And since the manuscript was turned in, I may have learned a few things. Uh, despite this um, 
First, I'd like to examine how deeply the story, or more perhaps the legend of Job, has penetrated Jewish culture, even without reading the biblical book. The second is to offer a correction to the way academics largely go about studying biblical reception history. We unfortunately continue to reify the idea that there is a line that runs from Midrash to medieval commentary to modern commentary. Some more daring researchers will add to these materials art and poetry as examples of exegesis, but even with these, we have continued to put Rashi and Ibn Ezra and other similar figures on pedestals, while other people, other genres, other media are all bypassed. The highway of Jewish interpretation is frequently traveled by pious Jews and academics alike. Today, with you, I'd like to travel what might be considered the back roads of Jewish Bible interpretation, tracing a single exegetical tradition with the hope that with this case study, we might think differently about how and what we study. The idea that Job was married to Dina, the daughter of the patriarch Jacob, appears in a wide variety of genres of Jewish writings, from, but almost never in a formal commentary about Job. It most often appears when discussing the book of Genesis rather than Job. It most prominently, prominently appears in texts by Jews in Islamic lands. And although it has almost no direct impact on Christian or Muslim thinkers, their ideas most certainly shaped how Jews discuss this particular marriage. Before going any further, it is important to keep in mind that in the Hebrew book of Job, his wife is anonymous. And she speaks only one line ending with a recommendation that Job curse God and die. He does not heed her advice, but chastises her for speaking as one of the foolish women. According to the Halachic Code, the Shulchan Aruch, building on earlier rabbinic sources, during periods of mourning and during Tisha B'Av, it is permitted to study the book of Job while Torah study is prohibited. In some communities, particularly in North Africa, engaging the book of Job did become the Tisha B'Av practice. A collection of liturgical fragments, uh, laments, excuse me, keynote for Tisha B'Av was published in Morocco at the very turn of the 20th century. And the pathlet includes an 84 stitch poem about Job for public recitation. The Judeo-Moroccan folktales Job was righteous, charitable, and in contrast to most Jewish traditions, wise. Satan slandered Job to God. God allowed Satan to test Job's loyalty by seizing his property and slaughtering his servants and children. The trial escalates and Job is caused to suffer terrible sores which make his body burn like fire. After their losses, Job's wife, Rachma, gathered firewood and begged, to make, and begged to make ends meet. Seeing her beautiful hair, the neighborhood women convinced Rachma to sell her locks. She brought home bread and dates to her sick husband and he refused to eat until Rachma explained where the food came from. His loyal wife replied in stitch 41, quote, that is the price of my hair. I sold it because of you, O light of my eyes. She returned to begging, and in her absence, the angel Gabriel healed Job. With her return, she could not find Job, only a well-off stranger who it turned out to be her healed husband. The poem is distinct from the biblical book in a number of ways, but I'd like to focus on the role of Job's compassionate wife, Rachma. In Stitch 36, Rachma speaks to the women who mock her, quote, she said to them, I am Dina, the daughter of Jacob the prophet. They call me Rachma in Arabic. How is it that the anonymous wife of Job in the Bible became Rahma and then Dina? Or better yet, how did she become Dina, then Rahma, and then Dina again? To answer the question, we need to turn to the earliest preserved sources to marry Job and Dina. However, before continuing, I think it important to explain that the biblical story of Dina is a troubling tale of capture and rape. I raise this to note the difficult content we will have to address, as well as to point out that ancient and medieval readers did not always read or explain the story this way. By the first century of the common era, that is to say 2000 years ago, the idea that Job and Dina were married circulated amongst Jews. 
Two Hellenistic Jewish texts discuss the marriage, although they do so in very different ways. In the Testament of Job, Job, nearing death, recounts for his children all that had happened to him. Likely written in Egypt, the Testament reworks the biblical tale as it was known in Greek. In the Testament, Job has two wives. The first, named Sittis, supports him through his suffering, and it's their children who are killed. As in the Moroccan folktale from 2,000 years later, Sittis sells their hair, this time to Satan in disguise, for bread. Following her death and Job's recovery, he marries Dina, with whom he has an additional sons and daughters. The introduction of Dina is almost certainly about connecting the non-Jewish Job to the community of Israel. Testament of Job, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, reports, I am your father Job, but you are a chosen and honored race from the seed of Jacob, the father of your mother, for I am from the sons of Esau. Pseudophilo's Biblical Antiquities summarizes the events of Genesis 34, tying Job into the story of Dina. Quote, Shem, the son of Hamor, forced Jacob's daughter Dina and humbled her. And Shimon and Levi slew all their city with the edge of the sword and took Dina, their sister. And thereafter, Job took her to wife and begat of her seven sons and three daughters before he was smitten with affliction. And thereafter, when he was made whole, seven sons and three daughters. When Jacob's family went down to Egypt, Dina and the children went too. Job is not mentioned. That Dina is listed ties her children to the family of Israelites. The absence of Job allows for forgetting their foreigner father altogether. While the Testament of Job provides no chronology for the marriage, the biblical antiquities makes clear that it followed her attack by Shem and her return by her brothers. The suffering Dina marries the suffering Job. Precisely why these early sources, sources married the two is never articulated. Given that the biblical book never identifies when or where the story takes place, or why the story of a non-Israelite is in the collection of Jewish sacred texts, the marriage to Dina helped tie Job and his descendants fully into Israel and more directly to the community of Jewish readers. Early rabbinic literature makes no mention of the marriage of Job and Dina. In fact, it largely ignores Job altogether. However, by the fourth century, the marriage tradition appears amongst the rabbis of Palestine. The biblical antiquities or the Testament of Job may have been the source of these rabbinic midrashim, but it is equally plausible that they drew from an older stock of common traditions or that they came to the same, came, or they came to the same conclusion entirely independently. The Palestinian Talmud, Sota 5, 20c, records the sages debating when Job lived. Abba asserted, quote, it was in the days of our father Jacob and his wife was Dina. This is in line with that, with that which is written. You speak as one of the foolish women would speak, and it is written concerning Laban, who had wrought folly in Israel. The passage is noteworthy for the biblical proof text. She speaks of, among the Nivelot. He engaged in an act of Nivela. Some suggest that this same justification underlay the Hellenistic text marriage of Job and Dina, but since they relied on the Greek translations, it's somewhat complicated to make that argument. The connection between the verses is also a bit slippery and suggests they're a post facto explanation for a pre existent tradition. The first verse uses the Hebrew Nevelot to describe the foolish women in the book of Job to connect her to Dina. The vile deed performed by Shechem is then used to connect Dina to Job through the connection to the foolish women. But in the first case, it's not Dina who's described. And in the second case, in the second case it's not Dina who is acted improperly. Although in both cases, the words relate to Dina, it's only loosely so. Genesis 57.4 repeats Abba's teaching, but without the proof text. Genesis Rabbah 19.12 uses Abba's comment to show that Job, who refused Dina's advice, was better than Adam, who took Eve's counsel to eat from the tree of knowledge. 
The absence of the proof text here also suggests it was a later editorial edition. Abba's teaching also made its way into the Babylonian Talmud, Baba Batra 15b, although there it's anonymous, but with the, uh, the biblical proof text. The Palestinian sources also loosely explain why Job and Dina ended up together. According to Genesis Rabbah 76, 9 and 84, and Tanhuma Buber Vayishlach 19, which are the texts that you have in front of you, the rape of Dina and perhaps her marriage to Job were a punishment for the patriarch Jacob. I'll let that sink in. It's his punishment. According to Genesis 22, 23, on his way for a rendezvous with his brother Esau, Jacob crossed the river with his wives and sons. The Midrash asks, and where was Dina? The text described Jacob hiding Dina in a chest because he worried Esau would see her and take her for a wife. They also agree that God chastised Jacob because a marriage to Esau would have avoided her rape by Shem in the subsequent chapter. The texts are then ambiguous. God either goes on to ask if Job converted to marry Dina or states that Job did convert to marry Dina. If the question suggests he did not convert, the rape by Shem and Dina's marriage to the non-Jewish Job are punishments for Jacob. If she did convert Job, the chastisement suggests that she would not have been raped and that she would have turned Esau to piety as she did Job. The later Midrashic anthologies, Yalkut Shimoni and Yaakov Koli's Ladino Me Amlo Es, prefer the latter reading. But an impious Dina, who may have married an impious Job, uh, is precisely who we find in the Targum. The Aramaic Targum to Job, which was finalized after the close of the Babylonian Talmud, presents a rather harsh view of Dina. Responding to Dina, Job says, you talk as any woman who acts shamefully from the house of her father talks. Note the switch here. Earlier sources connect Job and Dina with her foolishness and the vile thing done to her. In the Targum, as elsewhere in late sources, Dina is blamed. She is foolish and shameful, as was proven by her going out alone in the first place. To this point, the discussion of Job and Dina largely avoids recourse to the biblical book at all. Our sources function almost entirely independently. Even the Targum on this point functions somewhat independently, although overall it's built on a scaffold of the Hebrew book of Job. By contrast, medieval Jewish biblical commentaries were written to be read with the biblical text. Although the marriage of Dina to Job was a well-attested rabbinic fact by the beginning of the Gonic period, the Jewish biblical commentaries, that is men who approached the biblical book with the goal of explaining it in a line-by-line -line fashion, mostly ignored this tradition, not even stopping on the exegesis highway to refute it. This is despite the fact that Hellenistic texts continued to circulate that many of these same scholars regularly cited or wrote commentaries on the Talmud and Midrash, and that they most certainly knew the tradition. The marriage of Job and Dina is not mentioned by Rashi, Rashbam, Rabbeinu Tam, Abraham Ibn Ezra, the Kimkis, and not Nachmanides, Gersonides, or Ibn Kaspi, or quite frankly, just about anyone else. Rashi, though, in his commentary to Genesis 23, 32, 23, recounts the Midrash that Jacob hid Dina in the chest, but stops with Shem's vile actions, leaving out the part about Job. The biblical antiquities was known amongst Rhineland Jews, and the Hebrew paraphrase, paraphrases of it in the 14th century Chronicle of Yerachmiel includes chapter 7 and 9, but skips right over chapter 8, where the Dina and Job marriage is highlighted. So just to highlight my point, a person who in the 14th or 15th century studied the books of Genesis or Job with the commentaries of the medieval Jewish scholars could not have learned from them that Job and Dina were married. Among the Jews of medieval Christian lands, I can identify only two cases where the tradition arises. An anonymous commentary on Job from the late 12th century 
and printed in the 19th century, identifies the Talmudic claim that Job and Dina were partners to locate him in the patriarchal period. The second example is more exciting. Among medical works translated by an anonymous Jewish doctor between 1197 and 1199 in France is Sefer HaToledo, the Book of Birth. Based on a sixth century Latin translation of Soranus's gynecology, the Hebrew version is Judaized with a frame story. The book begins with Dina weeping at the feet of her father, Jacob. Having been accosted by Shem, her body no longer functions properly. She argues that women suffer because modesty and shame keeps them from discussing their bodies. Dina turns to her father for help as she badly wants to bear children. Together, they discuss anatomy, reproduction, midwifery, women's diseases and their treatment, and then the book concludes. Then Dina went out from before her father. Her husband, Job, knew her, and she birthed sons and daughters, and from them, the earth was scattered with people. The text evidences that the tradition was already well enough known to be adapted this way. The movement from the suffering Dina of the prologue to the recovered Dina of the conclusion, highlights that Job and Dina together get a happily ever after they deserve. The popularity of this work as a medical guide as late as the 15th century meant that it not only shared scientific knowledge across time and place, but the interpretation of Job as well. Why was it though, that Jewish scholars in Christians lands largely ignored identifying Job's wife with Dina? They did try to understand her instructions to her husband. Some wondered if she was a compassionate woman just trying to help her husband find relief. But she remained anonymous. The issue may have to do with the Christian neighbors. Although the church largely preserved the second temple text we have discussed, their impact was rather limited. Early and medieval Christian scholars showed little interest in Job's wife altogether. I've been able to identify only one early and three medieval Christian records of the Job Dina tradition. A fifth century Latin text, an anonymasticon, a list of names. It helps identify biblical figures who share a common name. The penultimate name on the list, Multa, perhaps Testament of Job's Amalthea, is identified as a daughter of Lot or Job and Dina's daughter. The 12th century Benedictine exegete Rupert of Deutsch cites Philo, or in our case, pseudo Philo, concerning Job's marriage to Dina three times, although he does so merely to draw attention to the tradition without any substantial discussion. The 13th century Cistercian Helena Fromont repeats this claim from the biblical antiquities in his chronicle. And Rupert's citation is repeated in the historical chronicle of the 14th century German scholar Globinus. Although the matter was present, most Christian scholars took little notice of Job's wife, except to explain she was Satan's helpmate. Although this depiction also matched Christian readings of Dina, Christian writers did not pair the two. Given no pressure to identify Job's wife by the neighbors, Jewish writers may have comfortably left her anonymous. By contrast, Islamic writers regularly discuss the name of Job's wife. Most commonly, she is, as we noted, Rahma in the medieval tales of the prophets and Muslim folk tales on which the Judeo-Moroccan example is based. These, circulated widely, are in per preserved in versions from all over the Islamic world, including a Swahili edition. As her name suggests, she was a merciful wife acting out of concern for Job. In some Persian texts, she is identified as Zena, the daughter of Isaac. Homophonic qualities may explain the Zena-Dina relationship. Rahma and Dina, mercy and, er, mercy and judgment, may be related by the common intertwining of the two divine attributes in Jewish and Islamic sources. The ninth century chronicler Al-Tabari identifies Job's wife as Leah, the daughter of Jacob. Leah, the daughter of Jacob, confusing the names of mother and daughter, but in so doing, preserving the same tradition. 
The many tales of Rahma or Leah and the prophet of, and the prophet Job in Islamic circles may well have kept similar interests alive amongst Jews who lived in their sphere. The influence of the folktale tradition is evidenced by an early 14th century Judeo-Persian poetic epic by Shaheen Shirazi. Shaheen composed a 170 verse depiction of Job, which focuses on his discourse with Dina, whom he married after Shem was killed. Satan incites God to test Job's endurance and loyalty. God allows Satan to destroy all Job's possessions, to kill his children, and to escalate the matter by attacking Job's health. After the losses, Dina tells Job he has no business thanking God. Rather than the biblical curse God and die, Dina encouraged Job to break from worship. I quote, my dear, it isn't appropriate to offer thanks and praise. Desist now from worship a few days. Devise a remedy for your own pain. A sick man may be free from all such duties. Do you not know that God pardons the sick and afflicted from fast and prayer? Job responded to his, quote, foolish wife, explaining he could not befriend God only when goodness was bestowed. Dana speaks for a second time, challenging Job, quote, you are old and sick. How can you dream that God will restore you? The suffering is making you foolish. Job replied that she could not dissuade him from gratefulness, earning him fame as the patient one. In contrast to the Muslim tales, the Judeo-Persian account is much harder on Dina in keeping with the biblical book. It also highlights that the modern Judeo-Arabic folktale is more closely related to its Islamic sources than it is to the Jewish traditions that preceded it. But Dina here, in, Shira, in Shaheen's work is not quite as foolish as might seem at first blush. Her conclusion that God excuses the sick and suffering from ritual obligations demonstrates her knowledge of halakha. In the same period, the marriage of Job and Dina, I suppose, finally entered a formal Bible commentary. The 13th century Syrian Samuel ben Nisim Masnut of Aleppo anthologized rabbinic teaches, teachings into a running commentary. It includes a summary of the passages about Job and Dina from the Babylonian Talmud and the Targum, but it doesn't leave things there. He asks whether it is really possible that Job's wife could be impious and wonders what she might really have intended in her words. However, the commentary was lost until the 19th century and its degree of influence remains thus an open question. From this period on, the Job tradition follows five basic, although not distinct, routes to modernity. The first is the folktale tradition we've discussed. The second is in collections of sermons. The third, through its fin finally its entry into formal commentary, the fourth route includes commentaries on Midrash and Talmud. And the fifth and final one is the rise of the tradition amongst the Kabbalists of the Ottoman Holy Land. I should note that these, most of these texts are on display in this room for those of you who are here in person. Concerning sermons, a discussion of reward and punishment of, in Deuteronomy allowed the 14th century darshan of Tudela, Joshua ibn Shu'eb, to recount the story of Job, and he expressly states that in, in his opinion, Dina, Dina was indeed Job's wife. What is significant here is again that Job is learned about in the context of Deuteronomy and not in the study of Job per se. A second example comes from a figure whose work overlaps several of these roots. Moses Al-Sheikh was a Kabbalist who used his sermons as the basis for his formal Bible commentaries. In his commentary on Job, he asserts that a pious Dina really intended for Job to bless God and not curse him. However, because Job referred to God as Elohim, he would mistakenly attribute the suffering of God's attribute of justice when he should have been appealing to the attribute of mercy. In Dina's thinking, this would make Job look improperly pious, and God would put him to death, sparing him further suffering. 
The text is significant, both because it makes Dina pious, and also she appears to have correct mystical knowledge, which she uses as a guide for her husband. However, Job's response indicates he could never ask God to shorten his life if he was meant to endure suffering. This puts the two on different pages about correct action and highlights a dispute about the workings of the mystical system of which they both seem aware. The tradition of the marriage of Job and Dina traveled further after the rise of printing. Genesis Rabbah was printed for the first time in 1512 and soon after the first full commentaries on it were also composed and printed. Elucidating the marriage of Dina and Job in his Or HaSechel of 1567, Abraham ben Asher of Aleppo explains that when Job says in Job 2913 that the blessing of the destroyer came upon him, he was referring to Laban, the destroying Aramean of Midrash and Haggadah. And what blessing was it? In Genesis 24, 59 and 60, Laban, Laban blessed his sister Rebecca with the hope that she would become myriads. She remained barren until Isaac prayed on her behalf and even then had only two children. The blessing was fulfilled, however, when her granddaughter Dina married Job and they together had 10 children. A commentary on the Agadot of the Talmud by the Maharal of Prague, who died in 1609, offers what may be the most misogynistic reading of the Job Dina tradition. I say most because the others weren't so not misogynistic. Um, expounding Baba Bacha 15b, he writes that although the patriarch Jacob had reached or near reached the pinnacle of spiritual elevation, it did not protect him entirely from suffering as he had a daughter, Dina. Maimonides, building on Maimonides, he explains that all human beings are born with deficiency or privation, and this is even greater in women. The deficiency is identified with Satan, and therefore, Dina was born with Satan as a partner, and this is what caused her to speak impiously. She encouraged Job to blaspheme and die, which is what she really intended. The Maharal warns that a man who follows his wife's advice is fit for Gehenna. Although we have already seen the view that Job's wife was misled by Satan in the context of Christian thought, it also appears in the Job commentaries of Rabbeinu Tam and Barachia Hanaktan from the circle of Rashi. Although consistent with Christian authors, they do not identify her as Dina. Now to our final route. Kabbalists, particularly in the Ottoman Holy Land, took a creative tact with traditions about Dina and Job. According to Isaac Luria, the patriarch Abraham's parents behaved sinfully. Aside from being idol worshippers, Terah had forced his wife to have sexual intercourse during her period of menstrual impurity. Abraham was eventually able to turn both his parents from idol worship, but this was not enough to undo their sinfulness and how it had sullied their souls. To remedy the situation, Terah was reincarnated, yes, reincarnated, in Job and Abraham's mother was reincarnated in Dina. Luria continues that Dina suffered the same kind of assault at, assault at the hands of Shechem as her great-great-grandmother had at the hands of Terach. Since, according to Leviticus 15.24, ritual impurity is transferred to a man who has sex with a woman during menstruation, the assault had the benefit of transferring all of the sin and impurity of Dina's inherited soul to Shechem, thus purifying her and permanently harming him. Job, however, had to suffer his skin affliction because the Talmudic sage, sages asserted that, he, that Sara'at was the punishment for someone who slept with a menstruating woman. In Job's case, the sin occurred when his soul was in Terah's body. His suffering offered atonement for the sins of the previous incarnation. 
Lurie is clear, though, that during their marriage, both he and Dino were righteous and pure. The mechanism of reincarnation was used to explain the book of Job, at least as far back as Nachmanides in the 13th century. It proved a useful tool because it explained a person could simultaneously be both righteous and justly punished for sin. The most expansive take on the marriage of Job and Dina is by the late 16th century Moroccan-born Kabbalist Avraham Azulai, who likely stole part of it from uh, Moses Cordovero. In his anthology, Chesed La Avraham, he claims he found a manuscript which discussed Job and Dina. According to it, Job married Dina when he was 18 and she was 59, after the descent of Jacob's family to Egypt. Her interest in him was piqued because both were prophets. And although he was a non-Jew blood relative from the line of Esau, he was born circumcised, which is why the Bible describes him as tam, that is to say perfect. However, it warns, he didn't convert to Judaism. Job and Dina had 10 children killed by Satan. According to Azali, basing himself on a Midrashic tradition, God distracted Satan with Job while the Israelites escaped Egypt. To recompense Job, God gave him double everything he had before. However, his refusal to convert cost him his place in the world to come. The tradition is noteworthy in that it has Dina living and giving birth to children with Job after the Exodus, which contradicts other Midrashim, which have her brothers bearing her earlier in the land of Canaan. Although not entirely observable from this brief summary, Azulai's text is quite concerned with the relative ages and chronologies of all the figures it mentions, their geographical movements, and especially their degrees of consanguinity. In this, it is typical of the interest in biblical chronology, which had begun to develop in the same period amongst Renaissance Christian scholars. This interest, combined with the rediscovery of Pseudophilo's biblical antiquities in the first half of the 16th century, set off much discussion of Job and Dina amongst Christian chroniclers and even Azaria de Rossi. For Renaissance Christians, the historicity of Job became something of an obsession. Philo's account of Job and Dina appears in the writings of Christian theologians Denis Petot and Jacques dazoul Père in France, Ferdinand Matut in Spain, and many others. La Pere's careful calculations, in fact, read much like Hesed La Abraham. The Flemish scholar Johann Drusius, also questioning the authorship of the biblical antiquities, ties its account of the marriage of Job and Dina to the Talmudic dictum. Among these men's concerns was the, the December-May marriage of Dina and Job and their consanguinity. But in the words of the English century preacher, a preacher Edward Vaughan, Dina is said to be Job's wife and Jews marry Dina that might be Job's grandmother to him. From, bon, from uh, Vaughan, both chronology and age appear problematic. If Job is identified with Yovah ben Zerach in Genesis 36, Esau was his great grandfather but Esau was also Dina's uncle, loading, locating the two two generations apart, hence the age difference. Other scholars says, saw Job as the son of Uz, Abraham's nephew, putting him generations older when he married Dina. Remarkably, the response to the concern came from a 17th century Christian Kabbalist, Christian Knorr von Rosenrod who after providing a Latin translation of the passage from Hesed La Avraham, adds that really they were only fourth degree relatives and countering concern about the age difference, he notes that in Eastern India, some children under 10 marry, although the people tend to die younger, he notes. As a brief aside, the rediscovery of Pseudophilo's biblical antiquities may also explain why in three popular stage productions of Job, one by the 16th century German poet Johann Lorch, another from the same period by Johann Bertesius, and another by the early 17th century Portuguese converso Felipe Godinez, 
all identify Dina as Job's dialogue partner, which means their Christian audiences also learned that Job's wife was Dina. Finally, to return us to the 19th century, a source, we'll discuss a, sor a source which helped bring the tradition of Job and Dina's marriage into Hasidism. According to Sefer Panim Yafot by Pinchas Halevi Horowitz, who died in 1805 and was a follower of Dov Ber of Meseret, the Talmud teaches that three counselors to Pharaoh participated in the plan to drown Israelite boys, Jethro, Balaam, and Job. Horowitz wonders why Job and Balaam went along while Jethro fled and why the Pharaoh drowned only Israelite boys. According to Horowitz, Jethro the Midianite hated all Israelites, male and female, because they had inherited everything through Isaac, while as a descendant of Ishmael, the Midianites inherited nothing. Balaam had reason to hate Israelite women because his ancestor Laban had everything stolen from him by his sister Rebekah, and it was given to Jacob. Job hated Israelite men because he was married to Dina, who received nothing from her father, while her brothers inherited everything. Balaam wanted to destroy Israelite women as well, but Jethro, who would have supported him, fled the scene. Without his support, he and Job could only agree to destroying the Israelite boys and encouraging the Pharaoh to do so. With our return to modernity, I'd like to take a moment to remind us that we've only ever so briefly discussed Bible commentaries on Job, only really two of them. The tale of Job and Dina is well attested across the Jewish world, as well amongst, as amongst Christians and Muslims over an enormous time period, and across a remarkably wide range of places and in numerous languages. What should be clear by now is the rich tapestry of traditions, which evolved about Job and Dina all without recourse to reading the biblical book. Rather, they built on one another. They're recorded in medical works and mystical treaties, onomastic lists and stage dramas, sermons and synagogue liturgical pamphlets. As the field of biblical reception history continues to grow, we must really be careful about which text we choose as representative. Much of the Jewish world came to know the book of Job without ever reading it. In our own day, we can likely thank Harold Kushner's When Bad Things Happen to good people for the same effect. I'd like to offer one last inadequate word of appreciation. The roadways of Jewish exegesis are far vaster than we have typically recognized, and Job and Dina walked many of them together. For 20 years, through the entire length of writing this book, my wife, Dana, has walked these same roads with me. In contrast to Dina, Dana's advice is always sound. <laughs> I don't always take it, but it's always sound. And the book could not have been written without her. She makes all of this meaningful and possible, and I am profoundly grateful. Thank you.